Thank you so much. So much care over the mic, which is a, a great thing. Thank you, Edmund, for that uh, introduction. And I'd like to thank Poets and Players for making this possible, for having us all here in this astonishing library. It's a great privilege to be here. Sometimes you hear a phrase again and again, and it makes a kind of a rhythm that sticks in your head. That's what happened to me when I heard the same phrase on television and on radio, and it's a phrase that seems, to, that seems to have stuck in the throat of the English language. The first part of this poem is made up of, of uh, things that people have actually said, just rearranged a little. Speech balloon. The Liverpool boss was pretty chuffed with himself, said the news report, for being so tough when he decided to snub the obvious choice and go instead for the goal machine. I'm over the moon, they said, he said. I'm over the moon, he said. The Barnsley manager was lost for words to describe his feelings when Chelsea fell to the tights. We played fantastic. I never thought we'd do it again, but we did, we did. And all I can say is, I'm over the moon, they said, he said. I'm over the moon, he said. The Hollywood mum was way beyond thrilled, according to friends, when she delivered into the world not one bouncing baby, but twins instead, to the astonished dad. And I'm over the moon, they said, she said. I'm over the moon, she said. Bollywood's hottest couple was proud to be blessed by the jubilant father, the superstar. It's a match made in heaven, he said to the press, between two shooting stars with shining careers. And I'm over the moon, of course, he said. I'm over the moon, he said. The Malaysian nation went mad with joy on Independence Day in its 50th year, when a doctor come part-time model, a local boy, went up into space in a Russian Soyuz and in zero gravity performed his namaz. All of Malaysia over the moon, they said on the news. 27 million people over the moon. You must have noticed. It's really quite clear. This condition has spread. It's happening there. It's happening here. It's full blown, grown beyond every border to the furthest corner of every country where English is spoken or English is known. There's no one just satisfied or mildly pleased, or chipper, or chirpy, contented, or cheerful. No one glad, or gratified, delighted, or jubilant, elated, ecstatic, joyful, or gleeful. All the happy people have left this world. You won't come across them anytime soon. And if it's happy sound bites you're looking for, you need to look way over your head for the words and balloons to the place where the cow keeps jumping over and over with all the footballers, team managers and lottery winners, world superstars, heroes and champions and legends and lovers and proud moms and dads and the whole of Malaysia <laughs> over the moon, over the moon, over the, over the, over the moon. say that I feel very spoiled having Chris and Olivia play before I come on and I think I want them there forever. I think uh, please come to all my readings and I, I need you there now. There's, <laughs> there's a phrase we have in India, uh, we are like that only and it's a phrase that's used to excuse a multitude of shortcomings, small and large. This one's called, Like That Only, and it's for Simon. At the sign of the black flip-flop, crossed off in red, by the door of the Ganesh temple, you're obliged to take off your shoes, and this you do. In the face of all the silent watchers on the steps, you bend, struggle to undo the laces, and come up pink. Not as a stranger might think, out of embarrassment. No, you point at your foot in its black sock, and there, escaping it, 
the pale slug of your naked toe. You laugh because you know, as all the watchers do, that this is the way of things. A sock inside a shoe is deemed immaculate. A sock exposed to public view, especially on its way to God, will grow a hole. Even the master of symmetry knew this to be true. When Gabriel and the dove fly in, the fabric of the day wears thin and frays around the virgin's face. Light folds itself over a boy's head, and he is shirtless, shivering, but believes that Baptist will turn from the main event before too long to tend to him. So you make a kind of offering of frailty, an opening for the world to show its grace. And as you point, the watchers, children, street dogs, bottom scratchers become your family. You are a foreigner nowhere. On imperfect feet, you go in to meet the gods, the open-armed, the many-eyed, the asymmetric, belly-shaking gods. In my house in Bombay, I often have visitors uh, from all kinds of countries. And one day, a young visitor who'd slept on the living room floor all night uh, woke up in the morning and listened to the sounds of India outside the window and said, this is Jurassic. <laughs> so this one's called Jurassic. Like waking to Jurassic sounds of crows above the banyan trees, the distant hawking, spitting, radio switched on, a hundred stereo TVs, our bodies afloat in underwater light, and the night a foreign country. This is how we learn each other, half asleep, in a language that invents itself again at dawn, sometimes remembers itself, sometimes forgets, and surprises us at windows we have left wide open. And the next one is about music, a little like the music we heard earlier, Tal. This music will not sit in straight lines. The notes refuse to perch on wires, but move in rhythm with the dancer round the face of the clock through the dandelion head of time. We feel blown free, but circle back to be in love, to touch and part and meet again, spun past the face of the moon, the precise underpinning of stars. The cycle begins with one and ends with one. Da, din, din, da, da, din, din, da. There must be other feet in step with us, an underbeat, a voice that keeps count, not yours or mine. This music is playing us. We are playing with time. And the next one's called Hirayat Old Bombay. Now, Hirayat is one of those untranslatable Welsh words that means something in the direction of a longing to return to something that's no longer there. And, of course, Bombay has been renamed Mumbai. Uh, that's because when politicians want to rewrite history, one of the first things they do is change the names of things because they know the power of names. Hirai, old Bombay. I would have taken you to the Nas Cafe if it had not shut down. I would have taken you to the Nas Cafe for the best view and the worst food in town. We would have drunk flat beer and cream soda and sweated on plastic chairs at the Nas Cafe. We would have looked down over the dusty trees at cars creeping along Marine Drive, round the bay to Eros Cinema and the talk of the town. We would have held hands in the Nas Cafe over sticky rings on the tabletop, knee locked on knee at the Nas Cafe, while we admired 
the distant stock exchange, Taj Mahal Hotel, Sassoon Dock, Gateway. We would have nursed a drink at the Nas Cafe, and you would have stolen a kiss from me. We would have lingered in the Nas Cafe till the day slid off the map into the Arabian Sea. I would have taken you to Bombay if its name had not slid into the sea. I would have taken you to the place called Bombay if it were still there and if you were still here. I would have taken you to the Nas Cafe. Talker. When there is no one else close by to talk to, you have this habit of speaking to yourself. I can hear you out in the workshop, talking to a motorbike or to its wheels, scolding a stubborn saw or drill. When you sit up in the study, poring over papers in the night, I sometimes hear you discussing, I think with your first dead wife, the question of insurance and electric bills. Once or twice, I've caught sight of you walking down the street alone, your mouth moving and your hand replying, because the conversation once begun must take its course till it is done. And every night before the clock strikes one, over the radio's monotone, you tell me our whole day from start to end, how we walk and where we walked, how the time unfolded like an origami bird, till we came home to bed, hand in hand, past the shivering queue of Saturday girls with pale legs and brave faces, their teeth chattering, their words hung in front of their mouths as if they were only talking to themselves. Undone. That tongue of yours is silver when you speak and silver when the speaking's done. Those eyes have a look that turns my quick to silver and proves my body's not my own, but away on loan to your fingers, bold in their skillful wheeling and their dealing. Your mouth, the alchemist, I am gold blown through the eggshell of the ceiling into a clear Morano sky. All that goes with me is the scent of you, which could be the scent of me, for there is no I or you, flung as we are to glassy blue. See how well I am undone with one touch of your silenced silver tongue. As Edmund said, I grew up in Scotland, in Glasgow. And the whole time growing up, I thought that real life was happening in some other country, some other place where I was not. I don't know if you've ever felt like that. But I, I've seemed to meet a lot of people who did, especially as teenagers. In Wales, wanting to be Italian. Is there a name for that thing you do when you're young? There must be a word for it in some language, probably German. Or if not, it's just asking to be made up. Something like Fremdlandisch gehören Lust, or perhaps Ein Suman das Land gehören Wunsch. What is it called? Living in Glasgow, dying to be French, dying to shrug and pout and make yourself understood without saying a word? Have you ever felt like that? Being in Bombay, wanting to declare like Freddie Mercury that you are from somewhere like Zanzibar? What is that called, being 16 in Wales, longing to be Italian, to be able to say aloud without embarrassment, Bella, Bella. <laughs> Lounge by a Vespa with a cigarette hanging out of your mouth and wear impossibly pointed shoes? <laughs> I, I love all maps and uh, 
uh, it's just the idea that someone has tried to put an accurate line on a terrain and mapped things. The first, uh, uh, there was something that I saw in Cambridge University Library was the Theatrum Orbis Terrarum, the theater of the world. And it was a map made by, it was the atlas put together by Abram Ortelius in, 16, in the 16th century in Antwerp, a collection of maps bound together as a book. And copper printing plates were uh, used to engrave it. This one's called When the Copper Plate Cracks. So this is how it is done. One hand inching down the, round the coast to map its ins and outs, to mark the point where ink may kiss the river's mouth, or blade make up a terra incognita, an imagined south. This is where the needle turns to seek a latitude, where acid bites the naked shore and strips the sea till it is nothing more than metallic light. The lived terrain comes face to face with its mirror image on the page, the world made up and made again from sheets of ore, slept in, loved in, tumbled, turned, until the copper buckles you see it clearly in the print, the place where metal has been wounded, mended, where the hand attempts to heal the break line in the heart. I live uh, round the corner from Charterhouse Square um, in London and uh, while the crossrail uh, system is, has been built, two things came together at once. At Farringdon, they discovered um, uh, some bodies. Well, no, first of all, the great borers came in, and the borers have, have the names of women, uh, Victoria and Elizabeth, Ada and Phyllis. So the borers came in from different parts of the city and arrived pretty much at, uh, at uh, uh, Charterhouse Square, but what the oh. is that better? Is it on? Is it on at all? Yes. 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 Is that better? Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. It was it was booming. Uh, so, when the, this ex excavation was done, they also found, laid out very neatly in rows, the bodies of people who had died in the Black Death. These were not the plague pits, they were laid out very carefully, uh, and they must have been very early on. So those two things came together in my mind, and this poem is called Waiting for Crossrail. Victoria and Elizabeth, Ada and Phyllis, swoop in from the ends of the earth, to marvel at the newly unearthed find. The tunnel has seen it all before. It yawns, and at its open mouth, these people have materialized, like words it has just spoken, a speech balloon that blossoms out of darkness. The tongue is black and can only stutter, starless. I lived on your street. This baby fed at my breast. We had names. We sat where you sit to drink and eat. Between the city and the pit, the builders and the diggers are speechless, staring into no man's land, its accidental inhabitants written out in rows. The earth knows the world is many layered and must be used and used again. It throws a blanket over them, but we are the ones who are shivering. We remember their passing as if it were our own. We are always aware of them, coming and going in our neighborhood. They are with us, hurrying to the market, or standing side by side on the platform, holding hands, hoping we will turn and say their names. They have been here all this time, waiting for our train.
The market at Smithfield uh, goes on all night. And all those men with the overalls, uh, which start off white at the beginning of, of the night, end up in the, uh, after the meat market is, is finished, end up with their blood-stained overalls at, um, at the all-night cafes. But at one of the all-night cafes, and I, 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 at about four in the morning, all this happens. The night ends for, for the workers. And at one of the cafes, uh, this is what happened. I met a girl, night shift. She looks like any girl, but her smile lights up the night. But her smile lights up the night shift in the 24-hour cafe. And this girl, when I ask her name, says, my name is Marvelous. Marvelous, marvelous. If I were called marvelous, I might be a different person. You are called marvelous. In my eyes, you become a different person. Then I ask, marvelous, what is your second name? And she says, it is difficult. I say, after marvelous, what can be difficult? So she says, carefully, makanaka. Oh, marvelous, marvelous, marvelous Makanaka. Your name is a song. Your name should be up in lights with the great names of the world where it belongs. Marvelous, marvelous Makanaka. I can see from your name that your mother and father danced in the streets where you were born and sent out sweets to tell the world a gift had come to them. And they called you marvelous. They called you marvelous. They called you marvelous Makanaka. And I wish every father in every country would look at his girl when she was born and say, this one is definitely marvelous. This one can only be marvelous. Then they would all be different girls. They would all have your smile, that blinding smile. Marvelous, marvelous, marvelous Makanaka. And this one's called screensaver. We were talking about mobile phones and how they could be a blessing or a curse. But I think uh, uh, there are times when things change and you see things, even technology, in a different way. Screensaver. I carry your face in a mobile shrine and take it out on the underground. Your digital eyes look into mine. I change at Farringdon, and I have changed. Touched by you, my skin is cozo tissue, my hair rose-perfumed ink, my eyelids are gold leaf. The woman in my, on my right, reflected in the window opposite, takes on the stillness of an icon. The boy across the way lifts his cheek to be pure marble, sculpted in living light. Together, we travel on into the night, all of us grown precious, each of us alive and rare. And this one's called Litter. At Derby Station, on the pavement where you stood, I leave your shoes. At Sheffield, in the cafe where you sat, I leave the orange scarf. On the Liverpool ferry, I leave your overcoat at the freezing rail where you pointed out Hope Street. On Hope Street, between the two cathedrals, I leave your photograph. On the platform at Euston, your suitcase with green tags. At the front door, I leave grieving. Coming in, I say your name. Saying your name, I bring you home. And when you want to write a love poem, what do you use? You use every, every instrument you have, every kind of language you have, good or bad, colorful, spicy, or otherwise. So this was a love poem. And I'm going to read this one, and I, do, I, I think I can trust this audience not to be offended by it. I swear, because I turned up from Bombay, too prissy to be rude, because you arrived via Leeds and Burnley, you thought it would do me good to learn some language. So, you never just fell, you went arse over tits. 
And you were never not bothered, you just couldn't be asked. And when you laughed, you laughed like an effing dream. And when there was pain, it was a pain in the arse. That was just the start. You taught me all the language you knew, right through the alphabet, from A to Z, from first to last, from bad to worse and worser, and the very worst you could muster. I learned the curses, I learned the cursor. So proper you looked in your nice shoes and suit until you produced language like magic out of your mouth, and I was impressed. And oh, I fell for you, arse over tits. <laughs> and when I said so, you laughed like a dream. And we blinded and swore like the daft buggers we were, all the way down Clerkenwell, and all the way up on the train to the horseshoe pass. And I tell you, since you went, it's a pain in the arse. And when some days I feel like shit, or when I say that I feel flat, I swear I hear you laugh like a dream. Not just flat, missus, flat as a witch's tit. That's what you say, flat as a witch's tit.